Let us pray. Startle us with your truth, O God, so that it may bring us to a deeper understanding of how you work in the world and how you work through us. In the name of the one who is life and love to us all, we pray. Amen. I think I've mentioned before that uh, I'm a diehard uh, CBC radio fan. And one of my favorite shows on CBC Radio is a show called Under the Influence. It's about the world of marketing and advertising and how these industries have an impact on the world we live in, even as that same world has an impact on those ever-evolving industries themselves. And one of my favorite episodes revolves around examples of extraordinary customer service that have been part of the life, work, and reputation of certain companies that have made a permanent place for themselves in our cultural landscape. A number of these companies and businesses are highlighted in the episode. The Walt Disney Company, the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in New York City, and even the Miami International Airport. And the show goes to great lengths to explain what these service industries do right when it comes to the people that they serve. The show makes the following statement regarding customer service, and I'm paraphrasing here. When it comes to the needs that their customers represent, when it comes to these companies, how they, the employees, respond, the tone they take, the language they use, and the kindness they choose to exhibit or not exhibit, is the greatest indicator of a service industry's success or failure in the eyes of those same customers. And the one thing that all of these service industries had, that these particular successful industries had in common, was they all shared a simple philosophy when it came to dealing with the issues that customers brought to them. And the philosophy was this, it's not my fault, but it is my responsibility. This means that all employees who come, to who come face to face with a customer's need or concern are not to dismiss the concern or send it off to somebody else if it is within their power to do something about it. Each customer with a problem that they encounter is to be taken seriously by the employee and treated with the utmost respect as the employee works with the customer to find a solution to the issue at hand. Even though the employee who was called upon to offer help may not have contributed to the problem that is making the customer's experience such a challenge, the employee still has a role to play in making things right again for the customer. It is this willingness to shoulder the responsibility for another's problem to bring about whatever help or healing can happen in the situation that makes the difference for the employees and the customers that they seek to serve each and every day. This is a philosophy that was not a commonly held one in Jesus' day and age. This was especially true when it came to the subject of illness and physical affliction. If someone was born with a physical condition, such as blindness, the commonly held belief in the community was that the ailment was somehow the result of some wrongdoing on someone's part, either the person themselves or someone close to them. Illnesses and affliction were seen as coming directly from God in response to some mistake, known or unknown, that the person or their loved ones had committed over the course of their life. As a result of this, there wasn't much of a social safety net to support those who struggled to live with an illness or disability. It was believed that if your illness or affliction could be blamed on some fault in your character or in your relationship to God, your neighbors, your family, and even your friends could feel comfortable in leaving you to find a way to live with your problem even if that meant your only means of support would be to beg for help for to beg for help from others every day the same others who believed that the problem that was affecting you 
was in no way something that concerned them or the lives that they were living alongside you. In other words, no one was willing or eager to help the neighbors in their midst who were in need. It was easier for them to find fault for the condition and to assign blame to, for it to something beyond themselves, and then to shun the person or persons in question as being someone you did not have to concern yourself with in any meaningful way. This would have been the reality faced by the man at the center of today's story from John's Gospel. It was more than likely that no one in the community knew this man's name or anything else about him other than the fact that he had been blind since birth. And for many of his neighbors, this was the only thing that they needed to know in order for them to determine how they would relate to him. Due to the cultural belief about why such things as blindness occurred, that relationship was built upon a foundation of indifference and ignorance. Yet another barrier that this man was forced to deal with every day of his life. And, is, and this is the cultural background that Jesus and his disciples are working out of when they come across the blind man on the course of their journey. Maybe that's why the disciples respond in the way they do, asking Jesus to tell them whose fault it is that the man was born blind. It's an uncomfortable scene, because, both because they ask the question right in front of the man in question, the man who, as far as we know, has no problem with his hearing, and was probably able to hear every word of the disciples' conversation with Jesus. And also because these men, who should have known better than that, show that their time with Jesus has done little to make them more understanding of the world around them and the people who are part of it. I find this a hard scene to get my head around, because by this point in their training, the disciples should have had a better understanding of how God worked in the world, and how they, as future ministers, were supposed to respond to him as servants working in God's name. They were supposed to be challenging the views and attitudes of the status quo that had kept this man down and out for so long. Instead, they are acting just like everyone else that this man had encountered so far in his life. Those who were more interested in assigning blame for the man's affliction than in helping him to overcome it. Because if they can assign blame for this man's condition to something far and away from themselves, they can rest in the notion that this man and his problem are not their problem. They can ignore him and his needs if they can be assured that his condition is from something done wrong on a cosmic scale. His problem need not become theirs if it can be easily explained away as having nothing whatsoever to do with them. In response to their question, though, Jesus offers up to the disciples, and perhaps to the blind man himself, a different explanation for why this man has this particular affliction. An explanation that does not rely on simplistic answers that rely on judgment or finding fault. Jesus responds by saying that this man's disability is not the fault of anyone. In fact, by trying to assign blame to the situation, the disciples and others are completely missing the point. The point isn't what happened in this man's past to bring him to this time and place. The point was what would, could, and should be done for him in the present. Now here is a point where our traditional understanding of the, the story in the text actually serves to make the story even worse. According to how this story has been translated and passed down through the centuries, Jesus tries to make this man's blindness part of a greater plan. The plan of God to use Jesus to show the people of God how God really works in the world. According to this explanation, this particular man was born with this particular ailment and was forced to live with it his entire life just so that one day Jesus could happen to come along and heal him in an effort to bring glory to himself and to God. 
So now instead of this man's disability being something he somehow brought upon himself, it was to be seen as something done to him so that God could make a point about how God truly worked in the world. In this commonly understanding, accepted understanding of the story in our day and age, the man who was born blind is reduced to something even less in the grand scheme of things, as his experience is made out to be part of some experiment orchestrated by God in order to make Jesus look good in the eyes of his community. The man, because he was born blind, is reduced to being a guinea pig for Jesus to try his healing powers on in the name of some loftier goal. Now that I think about it on second thought, if this is the best expl explanation that we can come up with for the whys of this story, I kind of wish we could go back to the first explanation. At least that one was based on indifference rather than cruelty. But what of this interpretation of the man's story, the one that we've commonly accepted, is just as far off the mark as the one the disciples first asked Jesus about? What if the way to bring light and hope into the life of this man was for the disciples and Jesus to respond to him in a way that challenged all of the traditional and accepted views of what caused a person to be born with such a condition? What if, by saying that God's works would be revealed through this man's experience of being healed, Jesus was trying to shift once and for all how his disciples would view such individuals and their conditions. What if all along it was the blindness of his disciples that Jesus was trying to cure all along by pointing out that while this man's ailment might not be anyone's fault or on anyone's overall agenda, they did still in fact have a responsibility to help him to overcome it in some way so that he could, find, he, could, he could be finally included in the ongoing life of the community. Instead of wasting all their time and energy trying to figure out who was behind this man's physical misfortunes, Jesus urges his followers to look at this same person through a new and improved set of eyes, ones that would see him as a person worthy of their care, concern, and help. Jesus takes the first step in bringing this new vision to the light by actively doing something to help this man to overcome this barrier that has kept him on the margins of life for so long. He does this not to prove a point about how God does or doesn't work in the lives of God's people, but to serve as an example for his disciples so that they might finally see for themselves what their ministry in his name was meant to be about because this would be a ministry that they would have to carry on even after Jesus' time with them was over. It would be a ministry where they would be called to respond to the concerns of others from a place of deep care for that person's well-being. The suffering felt and experienced by others would not be their fault, but they would still be required to respond to it in some way, in a way that could bring healing and wholeness to those who needed those very things. They would forever have a responsibility to care for those who were afflicted and to challenge the attitudes of those around them so that the blindness that made it impossible for them to see the afflictions of others as something that they could be concerned with or should be concerned with could make way for a clearer vision. Their job would be to cure the blindness and ignorance of those who held such indifferent and harmful views about the suffering of others, so that the whole people of God could be restored to a place of wholeness once and for all. And considering the reception that the formerly blind man received from his former neighbors, which more closely resembles an inquisition than a rejoicing at the miracle that had happened in his life, the disciples were going to have their work cut out for them when it came to curing those particular brands of blindness. Even though we in the 21st century have grown leaps and bounds in regards to our understanding of causes illness and lifelong disability, 
we still live in a world where certain conditions are shrouded in stigma and misunderstanding. When it comes to these afflictions, we sometimes still fall into the trap of assigning blame for why certain conditions happen for people in our midst. Instead of trying to deepen our understanding of how we can make our society a more welcoming and accommodating place for people who must live with these conditions. Looking for causes in order to find a cure is one thing, but if we get caught up in this search for easy answers that allow us to find an excuse to not care about the suffering of others, that is a very different kind of blindness. One that Jesus committed himself to curing during his own ministry, and the same that he passed down to all of his disciples then and now. We may never fully know why people get sick or why they are born with conditions that cause them to suffer, but easy explanations and responses born out of indifference towards those who are at the center of those conditions will do nothing to make things better for them. These afflictions may not be within our power to solve on a physical level, unless we have a specialty in medicine, but all of us can open our eyes and our hearts to the idea that the people who are behind those conditions are our responsibility on a much deeper level and that we have a sacred obligation as followers of Christ to do what we can to overcome our own blindnesses so that we can more clearly discern how we can best support those who are living with a physical reality that makes their lives a challenge. When we accept this responsibility as a part of our ministry, our vision becomes clearer and we are all able to see the world fully because it will be illuminated by the light of the world. The light that we all look to, the one that illuminates the path that we are all called to walk together this day and always. For the last number of weeks, some of the folks here have been taking part in the study of a book that was written to help deepen people's understanding of what it means to offer support to people who are struggling with various kinds of illness or physical affliction in their lives. In the time since the study began, a number of folks who have been reading the book have shared with me how much their eyes have been opened by the experiences and wisdom put forth by the author of this book. They have expressed that by reading the book, their awareness has been raised when it comes to relating to others who are in the midst of dealing with any number of medical conditions, and that this increased awareness has helped them to move more fully, to, to more fully enter into the experiences of their friends and loved ones as they move through these challenges in their lives, so that they can offer to these people the care and compassion they need during their time of need. It was and is my hope that by engaging the wisdom of this book, it might make us all better ministers to those who are in need of our care and compassion, no matter what challenges of health they might be facing now and in the future. Amen. <laughs>